The new second generation Volkswagen Amarok has landed in Australia and it has a massive point to prove. Using the bones of the Aussie developed Ford Ranger, the Amarok is being pitched as a premium do-it-all pickup and one that isn't simply a Ford wearing another badge. So naturally it's time to put the Amarok up against its segment leading donor, the Ranger, as well as the sales darling of the entire segment, the Toyota Hilux, to see whether it can set a new class benchmark. To find out, we've assembled three adventure focused variants in the Hilux Road, the Ranger Wild Track, and the Amarok Panamericana. Let's get to it. The Amarok arrives in Australia following a lengthy local development program essentially assimilating its design, ride and handling and technology to Volkswagen Ways, with pricing increases to match. In this comparison test, we'll put all three candidates to the test on road in mixed conditions, do some towing and hit the dirt for some gravel driving. Conditions representative of a common week for the humble dual cap. Now the new Amarok might use the Ranger as its base, but it has no shame in charging you more for the privilege. In fact, in this particular comparison, the Panamerica version of the Amarok costs about $5,000 more than the V6 Wild Track, and it's $6,000 dearer than the Rogue version of the Hilux. However, it does go some way in justifying that positioning with some added equipment. In any case, we're looking at the penultimate versions of both the Amarok and the Ranger. There are flagship versions that sit above both of those. And in the case of the Hilux, the Rogue is where it's at. It is the flagship version for now, at least until a brand new Hilux drops between now and 2025. The Ford is the most affordable option on paper to service over three years, with the Volkswagen marginally behind, while the Toyota is almost double the price thanks in part to shorter six-month, 10,000 kilometre servicing intervals. The Ford and Volkswagen both offer one-year roadside assistance and further complementary provisions if you service through their official networks. Toyota charges $99 annually for the privilege. The Volkswagen and the Ford both employ an identical 3.0-litre turbo diesel V6 engine in this comparison. It outputs 184 kilowatts and 600 newton metres and is matched standard to a 10-speed automatic transmission. Where they do begin to differ though is suspension, particularly the front suspension of the Amarok, which employs a monotube damper setup which is said to offer a sportier ride and offer more of a VW feeling according to officials. Then we have the Toyota's corner. It's a tried and tested 2.8 litre turbo diesel four cylinder engine. It's down on power and torque against the Ford and the Volkswagen but it matches both of them on fuel consumption. All three options here offer a rear diff lock, various off-road modes, hill descent control and recovery hooks up front. Inside, however, our three competitors pursue decidedly different interior themes. Volkswagen is eager to point out that this isn't simply a reskinned Ranger, and I think the interior of the new Amarok is a real case in point. Although the dimensions are identical to the Ranger, there are clear points of difference throughout the cabin. Things like softer, higher bolstering in the seats, which tend to make these seats a little bit more comfortable and supportive on longer journeys. There's new ambient lighting that sort of peeps through cracks in the doors. There's fancier graphics, which seem to present a lot better. There's also a totally reskinned dashboard and centre fascia but I'm not totally sold on the execution. So things like they've moved two cup holders from here in the Ranger to here in the Volkswagen. It seems fine in isolation and it works to large part if you're just carrying around coffees. But if I go to put my trusty old drink bottle in there, it doesn't quite sit square in the hole. It's sputtered up right against this center console here which is a little bit annoying. There's also less odds and ends storage in the Volkswagen as a result of this rearrangement here. And by moving the brake gain controller from next to the steering column to down here, it's kind of made the whole space a little bit tighter and fussier. Volkswagen has also offered its own touch with the steering wheel, as well as the buttons and switch gear that adorn it. So the infotainment in the Amarok not surprisingly follows a common trend that Volkswagen sort of set with a lot of its latest models. So it sort of started with the Mark 8 Golf and has followed from there. Basically there is no physical buttons and switch gear. You've got a few different shortcut keys here like piano keys almost and happily you do get a volume knob. But otherwise there's a home button on top of the screen that allows you to go through the different menus. For me, it's just 
fussy. You know, if I want to control things like recirculated air, I have to, it's a two-stage process. If I want to change the level of climate control, it's a two-stage process. Whereas the Ford is a lot cleaner uh, and a lot easier to use on the go. So it's not a total fail, it still works, but I think it could be a lot easier. It just means that there's more distraction on the road, you're fiddling around, relying on the touchscreen, when sometimes you just want a hardwired button. To me, the new Ford Ranger is probably the best execution in the dual cab ute class in terms of presentation, technology, storage, and outright practicality. And I think when you put it up against the new Amarok, it really does tend to highlight a lot of those traits. As I said before, I really prefer the orientation of the center console with the cup holders here, the novel little fries holder. Sounds silly, but it is actually quite convenient for stowing keys. The orientation of the wireless charger you just seem to have a little bit more odds and ends space and the cabin itself feels a little bit more open as a result. As I said before, the interiors of both this and the Amarok are identical, but it's just little 1% executions which make it a little bit easier to live with day to day. If you look at the passenger side of the front dashboard, you still have the same amount of cubbies and storage but there's an added open area here and you've also got these slip out cup holders which again sound novel but in day-to-day -day conveyance they really do make for an easier to live with proposition. The other great feature of course with the Ranger is the fitment of these six overhead auxiliary switches. It means that you can tap into these for the installation of fridges, lights, whatever you like without having to drill into the dashboard. If you're planning to accessorize your ute well this is a massive head start. So as we mentioned before, the infotainment here is a little bit easy to use and a lot of that is on account of this bank of hardwired buttons and switch gear here. You do have a volume knob just like the Amarok, but when you're on the road, you're not having to dig into touchscreen sub menus to just access those little features. What I also like about the Ranger is that it is a little bit easier to navigate its native menus. Things like the towing feature. It took me, honestly, probably 20 minutes to find these basic features like the trailer light check, adding a trailer, things like that in the Amarok, but it was just so much easier with the Ranger. Of course, over time, you're gonna learn the idiosyncrasies of this and the Amarok alike, but on face value, I just feel like this system is a little bit easier to use and it's a little bit more cohesive. Everything else though is pretty similar. This doesn't get the full width instrument cluster that the Amarok gets. It's only available in high spec variants like the Raptor. So that's one shortfall there. But otherwise, I feel like, again, the Ford, the execution of the Ford is slightly better. Now, sadly, the poor old Hilux is really feeling its age in the presence of the new Ranger and the Amarok. It just fails to get the basics right. It has a lot of hard surface treatments, and it's not moving forward with utes in terms of becoming easier to live with, more comfortable, and all the rest. This still feels very much like a workhorse. If I look at something as basic as, as the seating position, when you're jumping in and out of all these cars, you jump into the Hilux, and my instinctive thing to do every time is to move the seat down. But unfortunately, I just cannot get low set inside the cabin to really cultivate that feeling and feedback that I'm chasing. That feature is really accentuated in the passenger seat which has absolutely no vertical adjustment whatsoever and what's more for a $70,000 ute you're still having to move the seat manually on the passenger side not so for the driver's side. Otherwise it's missing the big flash digital instrument cluster. It has lots of hard surface treatments. The center screen just sort of looks like it's been tacked on. I do like the fact that you've still got a bank of hardwired buttons and switch gear so you can adjust things on the move, but it's feeling very out of fashion and very out of date. There's no hiding it. In this company, the Toyota just feels behind the curve. Sure, it offers some nice to have features like heated seats and okay incidental storage, but really not a lot more. So to me, the infotainment in the Hilux really is in need of an overhaul. And clearly a lot of these interior features will be addressed when the new model comes in the next 18 months, two years, whenever it turns up in Australia. But in the meantime, this system kind of looks and feels almost aftermarket with its presentation, its lack of intuitive functions, missing features. Like if I look at the Ford and the Amarok, it's got all the cool new tow features, but even things like the clarity of the reversing camera. In the Toyota, it's just not as good. And when you're paying 
$70,000 before on-road costs, I just think it needs to be better. The other thing here, it's a very analog feel in the instrument cluster. You've got two analog gauges separated by the digital screen in the middle. It all works, it's all legible, but it's just not as fancy or as functional as the systems in the Amarok and the Ranger. Happily, all three candidates officially offer everything as standard on our infotainment checklist with the exception of a head-up display. The Amarok and Ranger are tad more comprehensively. It's a similar story when it comes to safety. All three tick every safety box, but the Toyota is quite primitive with the intervention of some systems and far less intuitive than the Ford or the Volkswagen. The Amarok Ranger and Hilux are relatively close where rear space is concerned. Although the Volkswagen has more seat back pockets, the Ford again sneaks ahead of its competitors with the fitment of a USB-A port and a USB-C port. Okay, so what we have here are three adventure-focused utes, but let's face it, the tray area is still extremely important because they are gonna be a tool of trade for many buyers. So we'll start with the Hilux. It's the, the only one of these three that doesn't have a damp tailgate makes loading and unloading a little bit difficult. And it's also the only one of these three that's got a carpet lining. So you can pull it off if you want to. It's all Velcro lined there, but I don't know. To me, it's a bit of a waste of time. The blind feature is another handy one for security and things like that, but it really does eat into tray space. And that's the same for the wild track. As someone that rides dirt bikes and regularly uses these to ferry my dirt bikes, I'd rather go without it and just have a soft tonneau cover, but that's just personal preference. Four tie down points in this one. It does get lights and it does get a 12 volt outlet. So overall, I'd probably put it second in the overall order of these three. That brings us to the Amarok. It's probably the most sparse of these three. It has a spray on liner, which is quite grippy. It's got tie down points, it's got lights, but it doesn't have a 12 volt outlet or any kind of power outlet. And it doesn't have a tonneau cover. And I think for, 75 odd K, you probably should. Damp tailgate for that one, damp tailgate for the Ranger as well. To me, I think this is the best overall execution of tray space. You have these little spaces here to clamp things down. You've got the novel ruler feature, just like the Amarok. You've got a plastic tray liner. You've got a damp tailgate, lighting, these really handy rails, and also the 12 volt outlet. The other feature here worth talking about are these steps. Again, it looks like something that's quite novel and you know, a feature in the specifications brochure, but if you're getting in and out of the ute quite regularly and you've got the tailgate down, it is by far the easiest, easiest of these three to live with. So then, another small nod to the Ranger, but what are our three competitors like on road? Okay, so it clearly uses the bones of the Ford Ranger, but the Amarok has a distinctly different flavor on the road. Volkswagen went to great efforts to embed themselves in the test program. They developed this vehicle concurrently while Ford was developing the Ranger, and they spent about a claimed four years in Australia doing its design and its tuning. So the engine is identical, but this has its own suspension tune, and in the Pan America and the flagship Aventura, it uses that mono damper setup. So what's it like? Well, on first impression, this feels decidedly sportier than the Ranger. It feels firmer, and I'd argue it probably feels a little bit fidgety as well. Just in terms of that initial compliance, a little bit more obvious that you're going over bumps, and it just feels as a result like there's more happening inside the cabin. If you like a sporty driving feel, well, that may appeal to you, but I feel as though for the great majority of ute owners, they're gonna want something more compliant and more settled, which the Ranger manages to achieve. The other distinct difference here is steering feel. Volkswagen steering feels lighter and offers more assistance, which is sort of in line with what Volkswagen does generally with steering. So it's lighter at low speeds, it offers more assistance, and I would argue less input too. It feels like there's a slightly faster steering rack in this than the Ranger. It also feels like you're getting more feedback from the road, which I like. But otherwise, everything else here is sort of carryover. So the engine feels exactly the same. It's a great diesel engine. It makes that signature power down low with its torque, but it also spins pretty happily too, right up to four and a half thousand RPM. 
even 5,000 RPM, you're making power and the engine is working really well. It's a pretty efficient unit and it works well with the 10-speed automatic transmission. About the only gripe with the gearbox is that you don't have steering wheel mounted paddles. You do have this sort of fiddly plus or minus arrangement on the shifter itself, same as the Ford, but in any case, the, the gearbox is so intuitive that you really have to make use of that. It's more on sort of downhill descents when you want to use engine braking and that's particularly the case with the trailer in tow. But yeah, very close between these two. It's not bad, it's not quite as good as the Ranger. It just feels like there's a little bit more happening inside the cabin. Doesn't quite match the premium positioning that Volkswagen is pursuing with this new Amarok. Okay, so we've already established clearly that the bones of the Hilux are a little bit old, but what's it like on road? Well, first impression, it's kind of more of the same, to be honest, it should come as no surprise, but as you start this vehicle, immediately you feel more vibration through the cabin, particularly through the seats. It's really interesting in this company, just how agricultural the engine does feel and sound. But then if we pull away from the car park, as we've just done, that vibration is a constant theme in the driving experience. And the other noticeable feature with this, and it's not so much a positive one, is the steering. It's the only one of these three to persist with hydraulic steering, which again reflects the age of this vehicle. And it means that immediately you've got less assistance, especially off center. You've got a slower steering rack and you're getting more feedback through the wheel as well. And not always good feedback. I think you know mid-quarter bumps and bumps themselves in the road are being telegraphed more through the steering wheel. And that combined with a rougher ride means there's just naturally more happening inside the cabin. It just feels like there's more body flex in the Hilux. There's more sharpness in the rear end. And even over rougher pockmark sections where there is elongated undulations, taking longer to recover. There's also more road noise inside the cabin too. I don't want to bash this thing too hard because it still is sort of mid-pack for ride and handling in the dual cab segment. But in the company of the Ranger and the Amarok, it's being well and truly outshone. The engine, it works quite well at gaining speed, very little protest and working well with that six speed automatic transmission. If you ask a little bit more from the engine, especially above that kind of two and a half thousand RPM marker, it just does that typical diesel flare tapers off pretty sharply beyond three and a half thousand RPM. And beyond that point, all it's doing is making noise and chewing diesel. So to summarize, the Hilux is feeling its age and it needs to be better. I think at 70 odd thousand dollars, it should be better too. So when this new generation Ford Ranger launched in Australia in 2022, we were pretty quick to label it as the new ride and handling benchmark. And that is a title it still retains even in the presence of the new Amarok. It's no surprise that the two feel the same, but I feel like the Ford is a little bit better resolved in its outright execution. I think in terms of initial compliance over bumps, it offers just that little added layer of bump suppression. Over bigger undulations, it is super stable and impressive with the way that it recovers. And it has this knack of really slowing down vertical movements. So if you come from a big drawn out undulation or even a sort of a crest with a bump in it, it just seems to slow down movements. And as a result, it just feels like there's less happening inside the cabin. The other big point of difference here is the steering. As I said, the Ford doesn't feel quite as assisted and that's, that's just a Ford thing. That is the way that they traditionally tune their electrically assisted steering. So I would argue that there's less feedback coming through the wheel and it's not quite telegraphing things on the road as well as the Amarok. And the Amarok also feels as though it has a faster steering rack. So that means that you need more input with the Ford to get through a corner and you're gonna feel less of what's happening underneath you as a result. This is a ute, it's not a sports car, but people who are sort of chasing those sensations are gonna prefer steering in the Amarok. This just feels really refined though. It's a typical diesel engine in so far as it's low down grunt, but it's also very foreign as a diesel engine because it spins quite happily to four and a half thousand RPM. Works well with the 10 speed automatic transmission and it just feels polished. I think, you know, we've labeled this as the best ute in the category and as far as ride and handling goes, it retains that and you can see why it feels more SUV than any other ute in the class and yet it still can do all those ute things. Carry a load, it feels stable under tow, it feels great off-road, great articulation, great tuning of the electronics. Yeah, really, really impressive, this new Ford Ranger and today has shown us exactly why. 
In terms of fuel efficiency, we found the Ford and Volkswagen managed about 11.5 litres per 100 k's in a mix of conditions on test, while the Toyota was marginally more efficient, closer to 11 litres. The Toyota's dearth of torque was highlighted on test with a 1.8 tonne trailer in tow, lacking the go-forward of its rivals, not to mention the braking performance courtesy of its rear drum brakes. All three candidates felt stable and sure-footed though with a load in tow, the Amarok slightly more fidgety than the Ranger. On mixed gravel surfaces, the Ford and Volkswagen again edged ahead with their stability and knack for shaking off corrugations and potholes alike. Again though, the Amarok's sportier tune meant it felt imperfections more readily through the cabin, again giving a nod to the Ranger, while the Toyota lacked control and felt off the pace of its contemporaries. In isolation, the new second generation Volkswagen Amarok offers a huge step change in terms of its on-road manners, its technology and its safety. Against the established set, cars like the Toyota Hilux, it absolutely leaves them for dead. But in this comparison, there can only be one winner and for that, Australia's best dual cab ute remains the Ford Ranger. It's more civilised with its road manners, it offers a better execution in terms of technology and practicality and rain, hail or shine, it's just a better ute to spend time in. Have we made the right call here? Let us know in the comments below. And as always, please like and subscribe to see more car sales content.